Welcome to Show Me the Proof, Get to the Point, the B2B marketing podcast where we show you the proof in the form of case studies and success stories. And we get straight to the point with your hosts and founders of Proof Point Marketing, Mike and Gabby Grinberg. Welcome to Show Me the Proof, Get to the Point. We are so excited to have Jonathan Morgan join us on the show today. Jonathan is the Director of Sales and Marketing Ops and Head of Marketing at Achieve It, an Atlanta-based SaaS company helping organi organizations accomplish their most important initiatives. Jonathan, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Mike and Gabby, and looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, as, as are we. I mean, we've, we're, we've been talking for quite a while and I um, mean, you've got some awesome results to share. I mean, who wouldn't want, you know, a 70% increase in ARR year over year? Uh, so I'd love to just kind of dive in in terms of how you got there. Yeah, absolutely happy to. And, and maybe I'll start by giving a back, uh, good background on Achieve It as well for those that may not be familiar. So Achieve It, we're primarily a B2B SaaS platform. We work with government and non-B2B organizations as well. But really, we help organizations connect, manage, and execute their key plans and initiatives. So instead of tracking complicated projects and plans and spreadsheets and chasing down people for updates, they use our system to really automate that entire process, increasing in visibility, accountability, and ultimately staying more focused on execution instead of just planning. So one thing you know, that we've really struggled with year over year is really balancing both an inbound and outbound focus. You know, I think that's something that a lot of organizations, particularly in the startup world, will will focus on is trying to figure out when do we focus on outbound, when do we focus on inbound, and naturally that back and forth motion happens where a lot of emphasis in one year is on inbound. We get a couple of big outbound deals, so we switch the opposite way, and then there goes the game back and forth. So, you know, I stepped into my current role leading operations and marketing about two years ago, and news for the the listeners i actually had never done marketing before that it was you know based on some reorganization internally it made sense at the time so for me one of the first things i wanted to understand is what have we been doing historically and how do we create some consistency around our end on engine um, creating some background on understanding what we've what's worked what hasn't worked trying a lot of different things to really long term to create some consistency in that program and of course, we'll get into the details on that. But what that's led to over the past two years is really getting to a point where we've seen a lift in our sales qualified leads. We'll get into this later, but focus primarily on those hand raisers for an, from an organizational standpoint. And then now as well, seeing on the revenue side where we're looking at a 70% increase year over year for inbound revenue. And we're actually at the best full year, year to date, and looking at a 50% growth over that number as well from an inbound standpoint. So Jonathan, something I know I want to highlight and maybe uh, tell the story a little better. So you mentioned you only been in marketing for two years. What were you doing before that? Just to set the stage a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I, I probably have a fairly atypical background for, well, who knows? Maybe nowadays it's typical for the millennials out there. I've you never know. Of... We, ha we have a very wide audience. <laughs> and I, I am excited to hear this answer because I did not know this. So, yeah, let's get to it. Tell us. Sure. So I'll quickly go through it. Way back in the day, I actually studied civil engineering in college. I was, I guess, good at math and science, liked being outside. So I thought that's what I wanted to do. During college, got the chance to work at a boutique consulting company. So I did consulting for a bit. That role shifted into sales and go-to-market strategy as we were looking to expand. Went through an acquisition where that role expanded even further across multiple groups. And then I joined Achieve It about four and a half years ago, actually on the uh, customer engagement side. So as a strategy consultant, working with our customers, not only implement a software, but develop strategies and processes internally to support that. And then about two years ago, I shifted into the role that was one part revenue ops and the other part marketing. So on one hat, I focus a lot on systems and processes and scalability. And the other hat is heavily marketing focused. So. So, I guess throughout all of that, a, a little bit of each department uh, yeah. in a organization, which I, I think has been really helpful in my current role. I, I was think it's gonna... something, sorry, Gabby, what went, uh, uh, something I think is actually really important that you mentioned is, you know, specifically at Achieve It, you started uh, with a cust uh, you know a customer success or, uh, type function. And 
I think it's not surprising that you're as successful as you are on the marketing side, because really at the end of the day, marketing is all about understanding your customer and who knows the customer better than the people who are interfacing with them day in and day out. And you were doing that for several years. So I think that's, you know, everybody always says talk, you know, marketers should be talking to customers and people sort of, at least I think it's getting more used now, but you know, a lot of people take it lightly, but I think this is, if nothing else, this is proof that that is critical. Cause I think, I don't know that anybody else with, you know, virtually no marketing experience, at least traditional would be able to do what you did without having that customer facing understanding, like deep understanding yeah, what, of what they need. 100%. I think that's been really helpful in understanding what drives change within mm -hmm. our prospects and customers is I was spending literally every single day, either on the phone or oftentimes in person with our customers, you know, not just the end users, but executives of, of those organizations. So, you know, I definitely think it's important for marketing people to learn from their customers. A lot of times I, I feel like it's a bit forced, right? It's so we, we got to hop on a customer call once a month or a prospect call. You need to be really committed to actually knowing, understanding, and being with your customers. Cause that's what I think has enabled me where I don't have to worry. Like if I don't get on a customer call this month, like I've been with them enough time where I understand what, what motivates them, what drives the change, what their problems are. And that's been really helpful for developing our campaigns over the years. So um, I wanted to, uh, oh, no, my God. God. <laughs> now it's my turn. Okay. I'm going to stop hogging the airways. <laughs> This is what happens when we have an amazing guest and we're so excited to talk to them that we just start talking over each other. Um, you know, I want to take us on a slight tangent. I know we have a case study and I know we're going to get to it, but, you know, you really opened up sort of a floodgate right here around talking to your customers and not making it seem forced or contrived or, you know, um, not making it feel uncomfortable for both parties. So, you know, we have a lot of listeners of our show that, that obviously are marketers, but that are on the client success side or customer service side, or even in sales. Um, I'd love to, I'd love if you could take us on a little bit of a, a little bit of a client success journey here, Jonathan, and tell us, you know, how did you in your either past or, you know, previous or current role, um, uh, you know, maintain that closeness to your clients and, and like you said, not make it seem forced, not make it seem contrived. What, what were your strategy and what tools did you use to do that? So we're funny. We're, yeah, we're going, yeah. we're going roughly on the same, on the same thing. If I can add one more thing to it, which is you've got, you've had the two years, right. Kind of in your back pocket that you can rely on. I'm curious what you guys are doing. I mean, you've got a team of, you know, several people, I forget exactly how big your team is, but how are you making sure that they are able to, continuously do this as well because they probably don't have that you know two years of client success background like you do sure fantastic questions and i i'll be i'll be forthcoming i haven't done a great job of continuing to stay in front of customers you know certainly still uh keep in touch with them you know are engaged with them and engage with our customer success team is doing but i think that history has really helped me continue that momentum moving forward Honestly, I'd say the biggest thing is having a close relationship with the customer success team themselves. So I've, and even at, at Achieve It, I feel historically a lot of organizations, uh, the relationship between marketing and customer success is very much like a, a give and take sort of relationship or, or, or you're always asking for something, right? Marketing looking to create a case study or customer story. Let's go ask our customer success team who we can talk to and create that. Or, you know, customer needs some new collateral. Let me go ask marketing what we can create. It's always a, hey, I need something as opposed to how do we work together to understand truly what our customers and our buyers, what they're trying to do, what the problems they're trying to solve and how we can ultimately help them. So, you know, our head of customer success was my, my previous boss. So we have a great relationship. I was working day in and day out with the team. So I have a good relationship with them. Obviously, COVID has made it a bit harder because we're not interfacing with each other on a daily basis, but that relationship still exists between the teams. And then outside of myself, uh, we have a small team. It's myself and two other marketers. Actually, one of our marketers was a previous CSM. So she similarly spent a lot of time with our customers. And what we've done, in addition to some of our demand and focuses over the past, I'd say, year and a half is 
we've really tried to take a more proactive approach to customer marketing. So instead of it just being, hey, we need something and, and reacting, we're trying to develop continual new programs where we can be in front of customers, we can give things to customers that they're not asking for, and continue to evolve that to further strengthen that relationship. And when you say continuously give things to your clients, are you talking about like educational type of, of deliverables or experiences? Can you maybe share a little, shed a little light on that? Sure. So I'd say it's maybe just creating more consistency in that customer advocacy and customer marketing program, where instead of it being, mm -hmm. oh, you know what, one customer asked for this, let's create a presentation or collateral that then helps them with some internal conversation and more thinking about what may be helpful for our customers to know, not just about Achieve It, but about the problems they're solving and how can we deliver that to them on a consistent basis. So, I mean, something as simple as creating a regular customer facing monthly newsletter or biweekly newsletter where you're giving them those thought leadership conversations or we work closely largely with our customer success team of delivering monthly customer only webinars that's on topics that have come up on the calls. Now, that's mostly our customer success team, but we're supporting them on that. And then we're also thinking about what are ways that we can delight our customers from the marketing standpoint that they haven't expected. So mm -hmm. you know, one example that comes to mind immediately is we started a customer spotlight program where instead of us focusing on getting details for a customer story that talks about achieve it, we're talking about our customers. What is our champion doing in their day-to-day -day business not even mentioning Achieve It, that we can then promote on our website to our other customers and really help to make them look good within their roles in their organization. That's awesome. And uh, I, just to kind of close out this this loop here, um, have you, do you have any, <clears throat> any uh, qualitative feedback or anecdotal information from your customers based on some of these, pro this, these this proactive approach that you've taken in educating uh, and nurturing them. Any anything that stands out? Uh, let's let me think through that. Nothing that is like immediately stands out. I know we we certainly hear things. Our customer success team is continually reaching out to us and saying, "Hey, so and so love the webinar. They love the content. They love the customer spotlight." So I think by having that relationship, it's it's not like we're always asking for that feedback. It just happens more organically because we are closer to our customer success team than maybe in in years of the past. Wonderful, wonderful. So I'm, I'm curious, you know, you're talking a lot about um, experiences and you just mentioned webinars. Um, are you, specifically with the webinars, are you like leveraging some of that content, repurposing it for demand generation efforts then? So really it depends on the topic. I mean, most of them are more product and specific customer focus. And actually we have it where it's set up to you know, all of our customers are technically panelists, so they can actually show their video, they can talk, and it's meant for to be a smaller community for them. So because we want to encourage that community of most that we're not promoting on demand gen, but certainly we're taking the lessons from that and applying it elsewhere for ones where it is more open-ended and not, you know, revealing any details of customers, we will repurpose that in a forward facing toward prospects, but we want to be very conscious of enabling a strong you know, trusting community with our customers. So most of it actually lies just with the customers themselves. Got it. So, so I was trying to be clever with the transition there. It almost worked, but not exactly. Um, so let's let's talk about demand gen though. I mean, you obviously, what did you learn both through these experiences you just talked about and through your experience prior in in customer success that you said, hey, you know what? We have to change how we do marketing. Because right? that's really what you did. I mean, you completely changed the model and the, not what you do and how you measure. So what what was sort of the, I don't know if you want to call it an aha moment, but what is it that got you to say, you know what, we have to change things? And then what did you change them to? Sure, absolutely. So I'm, I'm going to take a little bit of the credit off of me a little bit here. I don't know if there was anything specifically that that I did, but I think fundamentally as a business, we had to think through how can we reapproach marketing to have more consistency? And not only that, but you know, 
it, it's you see all the news on LinkedIn and elsewhere of, of organizations getting 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollars in, in fundraising. And certainly a lot of that goes on the product side, but a good bit of that goes towards sales and marketing. And I feel in organizations like that, like you definitely have to be strategic with it. But in some cases, you can almost brute force your way through it because you have the money where if you make a little bit of mistake, it, it's not really going to be the end of the world. For us, we didn't have all the resources in the world to you know go out and try a lot of different things um you know we have i mentioned we have a small team of myself and two other marketers we don't have any bdrs or sdrs we have a small sales team so we had to think how can we rework our marketing and sales engine with less resources to be as effective as possible and that's probably the starting point for you know how we began to rethink our demand gen strategy because the first step was you know recognizing that the second step was going through and really understanding the business model and the business aspects of that. And then the third piece, of course, was going forward with the campaigns and the overall marketing strategy beyond that. So talk us through like what does what does your uh, engine currently look like? Like what are the different pieces that are that are involved and who's doing what? Sure. So this may sound like it comes out of the, I mean, for those that are familiar with Dave Gerhardt or Chris Walker, kind of their school of demand gen. But the way I take, typically think about demand generation is there's really two aspects, right? You have the demand capture, which is thinking about all the people that are out there actively looking for a solution like yours, whether that's in organic traffic or paid traffic or advertising. You want to make sure that you maximize as much of that traffic as possible. And then you have more of the demand creation side, which is how do we do longer term campaigns where we're getting in front of people, either through content or social or other channels that maybe have never heard about us. And maybe they don't need us right now. But when they do need something in the future, they'll recognize the Achieve It brand and the Achieve It name. So I think about demand in that way. But when I was going through and thinking about what resources do we have available and how do we even get started on this? We hadn't created that sustainable engine. So the focus was entirely upfront with our limited resources on that demand capture, casting as wide of a net as possible into the traditional B2B channels to understand what can we actually maximize in this bucket or in this pool? And how do we then begin to optimize and increase that? So we started out, of course, you know, making sure the, the basics of blocking and tackling, you know, was our Google ads up and running as successfully as possible? Are we active on Captera and G2 and other software review sites? Are we setting up retargeting and good advertising in those channels? You know, the content on our website, is it set up in a way where we can, you know, actively move, you know, a lot of our traffic, take one step back, a lot of our traffic on our website is going straight to our resources and our blog. How do we get people from there to our website and to, you know, more actively engage with the content that's going to convert them through the funnel? So we focus really heavily on, the demand creation, or sorry, the demand capture piece, which I'm certainly happy to go into more detail in any of those areas, to then figure out what is our, what is the pool that we're fishing in? And before we even go to expand that, do we capture as much of that market as possible? Yeah, I think it, I think it's critical that you mention that because I think, you know, we're kind of in this weird transition phase with marketing where you have a lot of companies still running the, you know, the old playbooks, the you get the you know the Chris Walkers of the world that are um, kind of touting the the new playbooks, if you will, uh, and I guess we are too. So I was just gonna say, and the proof points. Yes, of the, the proof world. points. We, the world. Proof points yeah. um, it's, it's our podcast, so I can say yes. that. <laughs> um, and then you've got a lot of companies that I think they're they're seeing, you know, results diminish with the old playbooks. They're seeing this thing, and they're going, okay, great, but that's. Forget, forget lead gen, let's go to demand gen, start doing all this stuff, ungate all this content. And they don't really think through the full implications of there is, there does need to be a transition to a certain extent. And there's, I think you have to cover your bases, right? So you like the fact that you focused on demand capture first, that allows you then to say, okay, we're, we're at least, we're gonna stay here. We're not gonna lose anything. We're gonna, that, that sort of gives us the revenue and the cash flow. Because you know, especially if you're a you know a non VC backed business, right? You that that's a really important thing. So how what can we cash flow into the next into this demand gen stuff? Like right? how can so I think that's that's really critical that to bring that up. The one thing I was gonna maybe ask for more details on is because I think it's an important one that you mentioned. 
on the demand capture side is this whole, okay, we have all this content that brings people in that's in the resources section, let's just say, how do we get those people over to, to, to at least the ones that are ready to buying mode, right? So may, I don't know if you can talk about some of the details there, because I think that's something that, again, is often missed. Sure, and maybe before I get all in the details, I'll <clears> take one step backwards. Um, back to your analogy of kind of transitioning from the old model to the new model. I'll say we're more on the new model side, but taking a, not necessarily a realistic approach, but a step-by-step -step approach to it where, you know, we focus initially on the demand capture. We're actually now starting to do more of the demand creation aspects. But when we think about how within that funnel, how do we capture people? I'd say we do take more of the new model where we're not focused on driving a bunch of MQLs and a bunch of downloads and a bunch of visitors. We focus on kind of our primary, well, our primary metric is revenue, but from more of the specific marketing side, we focus on um, what we call our, our sales qualified leads, but really they're hand raisers. So we're trying to drive whatever we can, um, whoever we can that fits within our ICP to actually get to the point where they're raising their hand and saying, you know what, I'm interested in learning more about Achieve It. You know, some of that is strategy. Some of that is because we don't have the resources from a BDR team to actually go out and you know have that full funnel MQL model. But all of our activities in our various channels on our website, it's meant to drive somebody to get to the point where they actually want to proactively reach out to learn more information. So, you know, one specific example I mentioned earlier was trying to get people from our resources to our website. Um, so we've deployed a, a number of different strategies, you know, just in, including more, you know, links to other places on our website, having more specific calls to action on what people, you know, similar to the visitor leverage achieve it for. Uh, we've implemented a tool called Mutiny, which enables on site on website personalization. So it matches their IP information with their company and with their industry. So we can be delivering specific and relevant content to that individual. Uh, we were asking them why they're on our website. You know, are they just browsing? Or are they looking for a solution? So if they're looking for a solution, we can you know, route them to somewhere else. But it's all about, you know, instead of capturing their email and capturing who they are, we're trying to figure out what are they ultimately looking for and how can we deliver that content and information to them so that at the end of the day, you know, they're likely to continue through that journey and ask for more information, ask for a demo, ask for pricing, and you know, move through our, our sales funnel as well. Awesome. I, I love that. And again, I think the that shift from, okay, our goal, our, our entire website exists strictly to collect an email address, a name, and a phone number to our website exists to help the, like you said, to help the hand raisers, uh, I think is that's a, that's the other major shift that's happening. And again, I do think that a lot of people miss, like they, they want to go to the, the splashy stuff. Okay. Hey, let's start a podcast. And, the, and the, we're all for that, obviously. Um, but you have to have that, uh, that, like you said, the demand capture baseline figured out first before you do all those other things. Otherwise you just got a giant leaky bucket, right? Right. And, and for the, I mean, maybe we'll get to this and the, get to the point part later, but for you know, people that are trying to figure out, is it demand capture? Is it demand creation? Where should I, I think about moving next? To your point, you do have to have a consistent balance of both of those. And I think the first step in getting there is really level setting on what are the ultimate goals and working closely with your leadership and with your CEO on what are the goals of marketing. I mentioned our, our primary metrics that we focus on as a team, we're looking at revenue as the, as the number one thing. What is our inbound revenue? I mean, even something as small as switching it from thinking about marketing source or marketing assisted or marketing influenced, we just focus on inbound. Did they come to us or did we go to them? So inbound revenue. Beyond that, you know, what is the pipeline, specifically a late stage pipeline that we're generating? Moving back up, what is the pipeline overall that's being gener generated from inbound? And then what is the hand raisers or SQLs? And, and that's where we stop. Now, we have plenty of dashboards beyond that, but we don't get too deep into the attribution game. You know, certainly we want to understand how to pull different levels to you know, increase the top of that funnel. But, you know, if you focus too much on attribution, I feel you're trying to optimize that specific campaign and ultimately losing sight of revenue. So level set on revenue, figure out what that pipeline looks like, and then you can determine, hey, is it our ads campaign that we need to optimize or do we need to overall increase the top of our funnel and creating a podcast is a better way to do that. I love that. Yeah, I think the way we generally talk about attribution is 
attribution's got its place, I think, within these, I'll call them demand capture channels. Like, okay, if you're in paid search, I want to know exactly which keywords are driving revenue. But comparing paid search to organic social to all these other things, like that's not where attribution plays. Yeah, exactly. I, I agree completely. Awesome. So, oh, Gabby was going to say No, something. no, go, go ahead, Mike. Go ahead. It's fine. <laughs> uh, I was just going to go back to, okay, so you've got your demand capture baseline set. What's the what's the next step? Sure. So the, the next step for us is we're, we're, we'll continue to optimize that demand capture bucket. You know, continue to focus on what are new channels that can be adding. You know, how can we work on our SEO and paid strategy to continue? You know, getting to the point where we're you know, all the people that are looking for a solution like ours that we're maximizing our marketing focus there. But also thinking about how do we begin to create more brand awareness for Achieve It as a whole. So we're still very early in this phase, but you know, with a small team, we had to focus on one than the other. So as we move into demand creation, we're starting to think through, you know, what are different new content channels or partnerships that we can launch that you know, either are selling similar services or are working within a similar market. Uh, I don't want to go off a tangent here, but we've recently taken a strategy away from, I mean, not away from our core commercial or B2B business, but starting to work heavily in the government market. So for marketers or organizations out there that work with the government, it's completely different. In some ways, it's 5, 10, 15 years behind the B2B world from a marketing standpoint. So we're trying to figure out how do we balance you know, creating brand awareness in that channel with our strategies in the commercial side. And then also focusing heavily going back to our conversation earlier on customers. What can we do to create as much of a delight within our customer base where they become an extension of our marketing team, an extension of our sales team? And we have a lot more people coming in through referrals as well. So you know, I agree on the customer side from a, a, a knowing marketing and knowing your customers, but also delighting your customers and giving them a good experience all the way through the pipeline is only going to help to further support growth of business in the future. So can I'm wondering, can you give us an example of some of these things that you're doing from a, um, a demand creation perspective specifically? Like, and I, I don't know if you can give an example from, from the government side, because that, that actually be really interesting. We, we've done some work in that space on the public safety side. So like we can vouch for the fact that it is very much behind and very different from your traditional B2B uh, marketing sales cycle and all that fun stuff. So I don't know if you can give us an example there. Sure, so de demand creation, I'd say in the federal government is extremely challenging. I mean, you go out and look at the companies that are working heavily in the government space and it's the, the Microsofts and AWS and Azure and companies that can spend millions of dollars on advertising. They can essentially spend most small companies' entire revenue on advertising, and they're getting very top of funnel brand awareness by just doing that, right? They're everywhere for customers. So we're trying to think, how can we do that in a more strategic way? Um, how can we be engaged in you know, events that they may be going to that are relevant to our business? Or how can we create content that's specific to them and specific to how other customers like them or how other organizations like them has successfully worked with us. And then the other piece, uh, you know, going back to personalization and relevancy is when they do come to our website or they do interact with Achieve It, you know, since we, since we work with a, a number of different industries, making sure that we have personalized information for them. Um, you know, it's, it's a, a real big challenge for a lot of organizations. You, you don't want to do too much and spread yourself too thin. So the way we try to think about that is, is try to have standard helpful information that we then can customize uh, specifically for a particular industry. So you know, as we do get more of the demand creation going and seeing an influx of interest there, when they do interact with us, they understand you know, specific to their language, specific to other customers that we work with in their market, how uh, it's relevant for them and how they can expect the relationship to move forward um, from here on out. So Jonathan, I want to talk a little bit about um, kind of what what were some of the friction points or challenges or, you know, how did you overcome internally with your team and let's say with management, with your with your um, boss, executive team, whatever nomenclature you use? How did you go from 
thinking, you know, internally, okay, we're, we're, we're focusing on lead gen to making that switch to demand gen, which for many organizations, big or small, is a radical shift. It's it's a big shift. It's something that, you know, it's like saying, well, peanut butter jelly isn't the best sandwich out there. It's really, you know, I don't know, grilled cheese. I don't know, whatever. That was a terrible analogy. Normally I'm better with analogies. That was a horrible analogy. <laughs> that was analogy. not one of your best that, moments. That, that, okay. <laughs> I'm going to keep it in here because it's funny and I'll laugh at myself. But but you get what I'm trying to say. The point yep. is like, how did you make, how did you and your marketing team um, help your internal team, especially your your higher ups, um, make that switch and commit to that to commit to that way of thinking in terms of your marketing plan? Sure. So I'll give credit to our leadership team. They've been very supportive throughout this journey and this slow transition. But I'll I'll walk through kind of the approaches that I took as a part of that journey. And really, I'd say there are a couple of key components that it makes sense to think through as you're going through this journey is, you know, oftentimes we focus on you know, your, your direct manager or your leadership, but I think it's also critically important to focus on the sales side as well, because if you can get support from the sales reps, from the sales team, from sales leadership, well, that's going to be additional resources in your, you know, on, on your side as you go for the larger organizational change, as well as, a lot of organizations are still battling a sales and marketing fight where it's not sales and marketing, it's sales versus marketing. And that's created oftentimes because of the older model. So the sooner you can get sales on board, the easier it's going to be across the organization. As far as how I did it, the, the biggest thing for me was making sure that I and the marketing team fundamentally understood how our business operates and the impact that marketing can have. So I talked about it a little bit earlier, but breaking down not the, the pipeline, not in a million steps and not thinking about MQLs, but understanding what are the basic business metrics that drive success as a marketing team. So if I, I'm going to break it down a couple of steps, what's our budget? You know, how much budget do we have across the board? Let's not get focused too much on individual channels. With that, what is our historical, you know, cost per lead or cost per hand raise or whatever that may be? What is our average conversion from lead or SQL to opportunity? Of those inbounds, what's the conversion from the opportunity to close one? And then what is the revenue that we can expect from that? And so by breaking it down into that extremely simple funnel, you then understand your business. You don't have to get into all the details of each channel. You understand these are the general metrics that we expect to hit across the board. Instead of focusing on way up here, let's just focus on making sure that we can keep this consistency through the funnel and ultimately end up in revenue. So I think by flipping it away from focusing on you know, just an MQL or just an SQL to the overall pipeline, you can start to have conversations internally that display that you really understand the business, you really understand not just that you're getting leads, but the long-term impact of those leads and can leverage that information for conversations. So after I understood the business, after we talked through it as a marketing team, after you know we had thorough analysis and reports that showed us how we were progressing, we could actively have those conversations uh, with sales leadership, with my boss, with the rest of the, the leadership team to understand that, you know, we've been focused on it this way for the past. <clears throat> Not that that's wrong, but I think if we simplify our approach, we're going to have a much more unified stance on what marketing means and what it does for the organization. And we can actually accomplish more because of that. So, you know, as we had the conversations internally, uh, it started with, refocusing our goals. So instead of focusing on MQLs or leads, um, first step was focusing on those sales qualified leads or, or hand raisers really in our case, whatever acronym you want to put behind it. That was step one. Step two was flipping that to focus on revenue as the primary metric. And then step three was you know taking a full step back and, and not just focusing on, on the revenue within a channel, but the overall impact of the business, um, how those come all the way through and you know, focusing on instead of it just being marketing sourced or demand gen and focus on just inbound. Um, but if I were to, if I were to go into it from day one and say, you know what, we're not going to focus on marketing source, we're going to focus on inbound, and we're not going to focus on MQLs, we're going to focus on revenue. And I didn't have the proof behind it. And I didn't have those strategic conversations. It may have been maybe not at achieve it, but in some cases that could have been seen as yeah, me being somebody or a marketing leader that doesn't want to take accountability or doesn't want to be held to numbers. You really have to walk through that as a strategic process 
instead of just jumping all the way to the end state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I love that. I want to go back to the very first thing you mentioned, which is looking like doing a, what I call a back of the napkin uh, funnel, right? Uh, your marketing and sales funnel. It's fun, like, it's funny because we do that pretty much right. Like once we have a discovery call with a new, with a new prospect, the next thing we give them is, Hey, can you fill this out? And we'll sign the NDAs. And it's like, what is your back and napkin thing? I'm amazed at how many companies cannot do that. Like they don't under, they, they're, they literally, they go, Oh wait, you want to know what the MQL to SQL and SQL to SQL and all, what, again, whatever acronyms you want to use, you want to know what those conversion rates are. I'm like, I do, because it's not just about like, because what usually happens is, right, if you don't have that, everybody, the reason why everybody goes to MQLs is why? Because they go, oh, well, the only thing marketing control is how wide my funnel gets. What they don't realize is if the if the end of the funnel is the same, it doesn't matter how wide your funnel is, you're still getting the same thing out. And it's like you can uh, oftentimes have so much more impact on, all right, instead of doubling my MQLs or tripling my MQLs year over year, what if I just double my, the quality of the stuff coming in in the first place and I double my, uh, a conversion rate or the other thing to think about is velocity metrics right which is okay if i can just get if i can uh, shift that sales cycle by half i'm getting twice the revenue right it's the same yeah, thing and people just don't think about it that way but unless you have that mapped out what are you going to do right and, and it doesn't have to be overly complicated i <laughs> you know certainly have plenty of dashboards and this is where my ops hat gets really really nerded nerded out looking at all my dashboards but i have those but for the conversation right now, I have a spreadsheet with, I don't know, two, three columns, uh, eight rows that calculates all this information. And I think to your point, it not only helps with that conversation, but it helps as you're looking at decisions throughout the year. So a perfect example is uh, we deployed a strategy earlier this year where you know one of our, our best um, our best downloads or pieces of content is a strategic plan template. So it's right in line with our business, right in line with our core prop proposition in the forum as they're going to download it so we can follow up with the you know sending that to their email we asked them as a lot of organizations do we said you know like i had a checkbox said yes i'd, I'd like to receive a, a demonstration of the achievement platform you know it's thinking that as they're downloading this value piece of content maybe they're also interested in taking a look um we had a huge increase in our you know hand raisers people saying yeah i, I want to take a, a demo of achieve it but the conversion from those leads to opportunities was god awful. Like it was a it was a big mistake. You know, we didn't get the results that we expected. But because we had an understanding of our pipeline, we were able to recognize that and say, you know what? Hey, leadership team, like yes, we were talking about the past couple of weeks how we were seeing all these additional leads. Uh, they're not turning into opportunities, so we're going to stop doing that. There's no point in us continuing to see send these leads to sales when they're not high quality. That's only going to ruin our relationship. And yes, we'll see a decrease in our SQL numbers or our hand raiser numbers, but we're not going to see a change in pipeline. We're not going to see a change in results. And because we had that information at hand and we had already had those conversations, it was no big deal. If you didn't have that information and all of a sudden you were going to go to your leadership team and say, hey, you know what? The amount of leads, our MQLs or our SQLs are about to be cut by 30% and you don't understand the impact on the revenue that that's going to have people are going to probably have a heart attack about that and, and try to start putting a lot of pressure on you to make up for that decrease in overall leads. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's just for sake of, of understanding, um, what, what is the timeline, you know, from the initial conversations that you had with your leadership team and your manager in terms of, Hey, we need to shift our focus. We need to shift our way of thinking about marketing. What, and, and then to, to the present, um, what what was that timeline and how long did it take from those initial conversations to really change the gears internally with your marketing team and your sales team? Sure. So well, thinking back, uh, probably began this journey around the beginning of 2020, where, of course, we were a gung-ho on a lot of new marketing strategies that immediately got tossed out the window. But for us, it was, you know, I'd say Part of me, I think, coming in, having a fresh perspective is I didn't necessarily care about how we had done things in the past. I, mean, I did. I wanted to learn that, but I wasn't committed to any way of the past. So it was listening like crazy to podcasts, reading information, talking to other people about how they did things. I'd say probably the first six months of 2020, you know, was, was focused on rephrasing um, and refocusing on that demand capture. So 
how can we cast as wide of a net as a possible? What do you have an opportunity do we have to be successful in this bucket or, or do we need to start spending and spending time and energy on, on other areas of the demand creation? So probably about the first six months, just figuring things out. As I began to plan for 2021, I think was probably the, the first time that I took that full holistic approach to the pipeline funnel. You know, it's it was my first time as a marketing leader creating our budget and projections for the year. And so for me, the analytical side was going to break it down pipeline, the, the total pipeline step by step. And for me, that was it made budgeting incredibly easy. I knew exactly what our metrics were. So I knew that if I had two hundred thousand dollars or five hundred thousand dollars or a million dollars, what I generally could expect from a revenue standpoint, if I hit those metrics. Um, so right about that time, you know, of uh, say fall of 2020, having that information arm, begin to have those conversations internally. I'd say the switch of kind of MQLs to SQLs and focusing on revenue happened almost immediately because I had those conversations right away. But it took me probably about another six months to figure out how do I then go about the ultimate approach of not just focusing on marketing sourced or marketing assisted or, or AE sourced or referral to just inbound versus outbound. And I didn't go into this earlier, but I think it makes sense right now. One of the reasons or one of the ways that I did that I think was successful is I, I didn't focus it on finding a way for marketing to get credit. I focused on finding ways, um, for marketing to, to give credit to other people. So a perfect example is, I mean, everybody's gonna have, uh, hopefully is gonna have referrals that come in from customers. Well, if they come in and request a demo on your website, maybe you find out later that they were technically a referral. Technically in, in some world, that's gonna be a, a marketing sourced opportunity or a marketing sourced revenue. Well, like maybe I did something on customer, but I didn't really do anything. I didn't, it was none of our campaigns that generated. It was, it was our customer success team. So instead of worrying about whether I got credit for that, I just said, you know, this is an example of how we're great getting credit for something that probably isn't directly applied to us. Why don't we shift that to inbound versus outbound so that by doing this, like the customer success team doesn't think that we're taking credit for it. The sales team doesn't think we're taking credit for something different. We can all be on the same page about, you know, thinking about the buyer journey. Are they coming to us versus are we going to them and not first on who's getting credit for what? So I think I'm, that's... I'm, the I think that's a brilliant strategy and uh, and a sign of professional maturity and and marketing maturity, really, because, you know, thinking back to my days in, in corporate corporate uh, world, it always felt like marketing was the darling marketing always had the bigger budgets marketing was the favorite of the ceo marketing always had the sexy jobs the sexy opportunities they went to the conferences they went to the events they you know they got the swag they they got the credit for a lot of things you know and not just, you know i think in in a lot of industries and in a lot of companies um especially large uh you know large companies that that have big marketing budgets or big marketing teams um, and, and I know just thinking back to my personal experiences, it, it often felt, you often felt like sheepish, like, oh, I don't want all the credit or don't, you know, don't put this on me or, you know, feeling, feeling badly about towards our other, other colleagues in, in customer service or, or, you know, uh, other teams that didn't get the credit or didn't get sort of their dues. So I think that's just a really brilliant, brilliant strategy on your part. And ultimately, it shows that that you're a very um, wise marketing leader, even if you say you you don't have much of a marketing background, Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I appreciate that, Gabby. I really appreciate the kind words. And I, you know, I think, you know, whether you're new to marketing or you've spent a lot of time in marketing, really the, the core fundamentals maybe comes out of two or three pieces. Yeah. You know, do you understand your customers? Do you understand uh, how to work with others in the organization? You know, are, are you, can you build those relationships to have strong advocates? And do you understand how to problem solve? I think by having those three things, uh, whether you're new or whether you've been in marketing for 20 years, like you can figure things out if you understand those three elements. Yes. Yes. And, you know, unfortunately, those are things that they don't teach you in school when you're going to, when you're getting your marketing or your, your communication degree. It's, it's really things that you kind of have to learn and figure out. And I'm wondering, 
uh, again, taking us on a slight tangent here, but, you know, based on those three things that you just mentioned, how do you think that somebody that's just starting out in a marketing career or maybe somebody who's very seasoned, but just not seeing the growth or not seeing uh, the, 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 the acceleration in their career that they'd like to see? How do you think that those are how do you think those are muscles that they can flex or what things that should someone be doing to really hone those skills? Oh, I love that. Uh, the way I would think about it is, and this is again, operational mindset that comes in is anytime I'm trying to solve a problem, I want to break it down to the fundamental pieces of that problem and figure out, you know, where is the squeaky wheel that resources and effort needs to be applied to. So thinking about this three elements and probably there's more, but for me, these are the three most important of customer internal relationships and, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on the third one, um, and problem solving. <clears throat> Taking a look at those, doing a self-diagnosis, doing a team diagnosis, doing an organizational diagnosis and figuring out where is the biggest gap and where is the biggest opportunity for not just long-term, but immediate improvement, you know, having that quick win, having that momentum that we can continue to move forward with. So if you do that analysis and you find that, you know what, I haven't talked to a customer in six months or two years, and I don't really talk to our customer success team, it's an immediate opportunity for you to just make a commitment once a month or once a week to hop on a customer call. Or nowadays with Zoom and with Gong, you don't even have to, you can just listen to those customer calls and begin to collect that information. Or maybe you're, you know, you don't have a good relationship with sales or, you know, organizationally there are silos that exist between the different departments. Well, maybe that's where you start. Maybe you figure out, um, you know, let me have a Zoom chat or a coffee or lunch with the sales leadership, try to figure out how we can align on our goals. You know, starting with goals and, and common goals as the starting point and building that relationship long term to have that partner in the transition or, or in your your learning uh, journey moving forward or on the problem solving side i mean you know having the skill set or the understanding of how to break down a problem or having people on your team that have more of the analytical mindset to think through that or you know nowadays and certainly during COVID, this has been a big benefit for me is having people in your network that you can go to for problem solving. Um, if you've never experienced something before, knowing who you can pick up the phone or Slack or whatever the case may be to get some additional insight so that, you know, you're not making this decision or, or, or big change without having already consulted somebody who's maybe been through it before. Yeah. I love that. I mean, the, the thing you mentioned at the beginning, especially where, you know, breaking down that problem, it's really all, it's about systems thinking, right? It's, what are the yep. different pieces that work together? And even kind of going back to, you know, why do you break down the funnel? That's, that's sort of a subset of that, right? It's systems thinking of, okay, well, what impacts, you know, SQL to SQO and what impacts SQO to close and et cetera, right? And putting all those pieces together, now you can figure out where to, where to work and how one thing impacts the other, et cetera. And that's the same thing with really everything in general. It's not even just marketing, but so I think that's awesome. Before we get to the point, I want to make sure that we share the proof. So Jonathan, you've shared with us that, you know, it took about roughly six months in your in, entering into your new position to kind of get up to speed, learn what was done, learn what was going on, but then also immerse yourself and, and um, really arm yourself with the information and knowledge that you needed to bring this up to your, to your leadership team and to your manager. And then roughly another six months from there, to um, to really make that shift in your marketing and make that shift in the output with your team and collaborating with other teams. So roughly 12 months to really um, make this commitment, make this shift from, from lead gen to demand gen as part of your marketing strategy. What has been some of the proof? Can you share with us some of the um, revenue numbers or metrics or, you know, any, any proof that you can share that, that this is actually working and that this was the right strategy for you and for Achieve It? Sure, absolutely. And I'll say, well, my journey was 12 months. It doesn't necessarily mean that yours has to be 12 months, people considering that. I think as I was going through it, I was, I mean, I was learning a lot of these things as I was going through it. I think if you're sitting here today, you're in an old school model of tracking MQLs and, and that's all you're focused on. And you want to get to the point where you're focused kind of at the end of the journey on inbound revenue. If you have, you know, those people on your side and you have an understanding of your funnel, you can move through that a lot more, a lot more quickly, quicker, whatever the word is. 
Um, you can go through that process at a different pace. Um, so don't feel like you have to wait, but certainly go through it in a strategic fashion. Don't jump completely to the end zone today. Um, work through it with your leadership and with your partners in the organization in a strategic way. But as, as for the proof side of it goes, um, so the immediate place we saw it was in the, um, the actual number of hand raises that we were getting. So just by having con some consistency and casting that wider net and beginning to optimize those programs, I'd say within the, you know, by the end of 2020, even earlier, we were so about, you know, say six to nine months of being committed to that. We were seeing about a 50% increase in our SQLs by being out there more, by giving people the sort of content they needed on our website and where they need to go. We were seeing about a 50% increase in SQLs. But for us, we still never knew what is that going to turn out to in revenue. Like in the back of my mind, I really hoped I said, you know, I understand my funnel. I think I'm pretty confident by increasing the SQLs by 50%. We're going to see a subsequent increase and in, you know further down the pipeline and ultimately in revenue um so at, at where we're at right now you know we actually don't have as good of a sql to opportunity conversion as i hoped so you know that was something that hey we missed based on previous years but the better thing is that of those opportunities that are happening we're converting them into close to one revenue at a higher percentage right so again understanding those aspects of the funnels and we've been able to, to burst to boost excuse me our opportunity close rate by about 20 25 percent um, so that's you know a, a positive increase increase our average sales cycle is much less than we anticipated our average sales price is up by about 30 percent from the previous year and is at our, our highest of any year in company history and so ultimately that's led us to the point where through the first half of this year again we're a little bit of a month over that right now but through the first half through the end of june we're at the highest full year total that we have been in company history. And if we continue that forward, you know, that's at a minimum is going to be a 50% improvement, hopefully over our best year and looking at projected 70% improvement in, in inbound revenue from last year. Wow. And then I guess one other thing uh, kind of continuing the funnel that I think is also important is, is I even go one step further to look at customer acquisition cost and, and CAC payback period. So, you know, you can get into so many different calculations on that, but, you know, I try to focus on it outside of the full organization. What is our, our marketing CAC and what is our marketing CAC payback? And even if the numbers aren't perfect, understanding the trends is really important to that. And the biggest thing for us is especially that as we've continued to have a leaner and leader team, you know, our, our marketing cost, customer acquisition cost is down by about 60% year over year and our ROI that kind of coincides with that kind of demand gen spend result is up by about 40 percent so wow. you know understanding you know how you can pull those levers be more efficient you're not just going to see revenue impacts you can see impacts on the kind of the true business metrics as well those are some serious metrics and some serious proof as we like to say <laughs> that the pudding is working that the that you're that, right the proof is in the pudding here so that's amazing and i think one final call out that I want to say that you just said is, you know, it's not just about revenue, which of course it is, but, but also about looking at the business metrics. And I think um, so much of the thinking in the past when it was really just about lead generation really wasn't, didn't have that business um, mindset. It didn't have that, that view of the horizon of the business uh, landscape. It was really just thinking, what are we doing in marketing? Are we driving leads? Are we driving leads? You know, so I think, I think that's a huge call out and a huge mind shift as well for a lot of marketers that haven't yet committed to, or are still in an organization that's very traditional, um, and, and maybe not as, as forward thinking as they need to be that really, when you make the shift from lead gen to demand gen, you're positioning yourself to really be in sync with with the business goals and that in and of itself is 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 a is an opportunity to align with your leadership and your sales team and and other leaders in the company and to really prove your marketing chops and prove that you know what that big budget that we're getting in marketing well it's well deserved and it's 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 paying off so awesome awesome job jonathan mike yeah. any any final thoughts on your end? My last final thought was, I think, the again, this this last piece that you talked about, you know, 
uh, CAC and payback period, et cetera, I think is critical because I think it's the, we'll call it 2.0 or whatever. It's this next shift of, I think, you know, not the yes, marketers are starting to do more revenue marketing, whatever, whatever label you want to put on it, revenue focus. But I think what's missing a lot, especially in, if you're in a non VC backed, you know, environment where profitability is critical. I think a lot of marketers don't think that way still. And I think that's a big miss because you have to tie everything back to, again, business outcomes of business metrics rather than just marketing metrics. And I think thinking of it as, okay, what's my payback period on this? Can I cash flow this? Right. Is this actually like, yeah, okay, I'm getting customers and it seems like it's driving revenue, but is this actually sustainable over the next six months, 12 months, whatever it is. And I think a lot of marketing teams don't look at it. And part of it, I think is a function of, how much money is being thrown out there and all these VC backed startups and whatnot. Like they don't have to think about it right away. Um, but for everybody else out there, I think that's a, that's a really critical piece that, that needs to be there. Right. Exactly. It's really getting to the point of how effective is our marketing program? Not just how, I mean, ideally we want to get to the point where how much revenue is our marketing team generating, but that that step two is how effective is our marketing team? Um, and honestly, it's, it's not hard information to calculate. The, sometimes the metrics and the name sound scary, but you understand how much revenue you're bringing in. And we've already talked through that. You should understand how much your demand gen budget is and what you're spending. And then you know, work with your finance team, get the overall marketing budget spend. And, and it's a couple numbers that you need and, and you can get those numbers. You know, it's, it's something that you know, as you get more and more budget, you can obviously increase that revenue. Hopefully you've got scalable processes where as you put more money in, you're getting more money out, but you want to make sure that that's being done efficiently. And that as you get more money, you're not being less efficient and ultimately spending more, getting a less ROI. Now, one well, speak- last question for you. Speak- Gabby, I think you and I were going to go the same direction after a conversation with Gary, I'm guessing. Uh, no, I was going to say oh, okay. that it's time to get to the point, but if you have something, <laughs> I have then... one last, I, see, I, I, I have one, one last question, which is, you know, you mentioned working with your finance team. How do you sort of two part question? One is how do you, uh, present, um, business cases, use cases, whatever you want to call them, uh, to the finance team for approval. And then how do you end up stress testing and choosing what you're actually going to execute on? Man, that's a loaded question. I'll try to keep it pretty simple here. But I, when I prepare for really any of these conversations, I talked about a, a number of it once for gaining support. I try to focus on the person that I'm presenting to and what is the type of information that they like to digest. So, um, you know, for someone that's very analytical, normally that's finance person, you want to talk through the actual details of the numbers and and what you can expect and what you propose will change by implementing a new program or new system or a new campaign. So that's going to be very analytical focused. And maybe if you're focused, uh, maybe your, your CEO or other leadership member um, doesn't want to get into all the details. They have limited time. Well, you need to focus on the high level benefits of what's going to happen from it. So really understanding who the person is that you're talking to, what they like to see and equipping them with that information. As far as our team internally for how we decide what to do, um, you know, we have a massive list that we go through every quarter and create for the, the different ideas and projects that we want to run for that quarter and into the future. Um, we go through and we prioritize it, but always thinking about um, revenue and, and revenue effectiveness um, as our leading driver for prioritization. Um, that's what we want to focus on. We, we, of course, have to focus long term, but we want to make sure that uh, with our limited resources that we're doing as many revenue driving activities as possible. Awesome. Good answer. All right. I think it's now time to get to the point. What do you think, Mike? I feel like we've kind of already gotten to the point. But we have. We can you recap know, some things. We we have. I mean, Jonathan, you, you've done such a thorough job of showing the proof, but also kind of how you got there along the way that we have shared quite a few um, important things about getting to the point. But let's get to the point anyway. Let's recap um, kind of some of the steps that you took again, to go from being lead gen focused to demand gen focus, but then maybe kind of share with us and, and our listeners today, um, maybe some things that you did that you would have done differently if you were in a different organization or, or, or coming into a new role. You know, you mentioned earlier that it took about 12 months, but that it 
could be done in 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 shorter time. So maybe um, kind of give us give us the your playbook on how you did this, and then things that our listeners could do differently, or things that they should keep in mind when um, switching their, their their marketing focus. Yeah, absolutely. So very first thing before you even make the shift for to from lead gen to demand gen, understand your customers. You're not going to be successful with it. You're not going to have the buy-in across the organization if you don't understand your customers. So that's was kind of already a, a checkbox for me because I had spent time in that uh, from my previous role, but that's certainly going to be the most important thing. Uh, outside of that, if you don't already really understand the business, understand your business model, understand the impact that marketing can have, understand your pipeline and how uh, from a conversion standpoint, things marketing leads move from the very top all the way into revenue and make sure, you know, of course, have that information, but you should get to the point, and this is where I'm at now, where if somebody asks me a question, like, I don't have to go consult the numbers. I know exactly what it is because I've lived and breathed it for so long. So understand marketing business and the overall business so that you can begin to think about how you even go about that journey and whether it makes sense to now or in six months or a year. And then once you understand those levers, you know, start to think out who are the key people internally that I need to get on board to make this transition successful. So personally, I didn't have a lot of difficulty with that. I'd gone through, had close relationships previously, uh, really scoped out the business case for making the change. Um, but for those that may or may not have that, you know, recognize the, the, the path of least resistance to making that change. You know, maybe you already have a good relationship with the head of customer success, or maybe go talk to, to him or her about that to get some advice. Maybe you don't have as great a relationship with the VP of sales. Well, maybe that's somebody that you hold till the end until you've already had a number of conversations to really flush through that business case. And then, you know, I, I skipped over this earlier, but you know, make sure you're also thinking about the individual teams as well and not just leadership. Um, these changes, particularly within sales and marketing, is going to have a great impact on AEs. AEs hate getting terrible leads. The more terrible leads they get, the less engaged they're going to be with following up with the good ones. So like, get them on board. They're going to drive excitement throughout the organization. And then you know, really focus on the, the longer term impacts for the organization as a whole. So I'll, I'll, I won't go through all the specific you know, demand gen changes from a campaign standpoint right now, but you know, if I were to go back and do things differently, I, I probably would have done it a, a bit quicker. I mean, knowing what I know now. Um, but again, as I talked about earlier, um, still learning a lot of this. I think there's been a lot of great content put out around this journey. So start thinking about it today, um, what you can do and what are the major steps in that journey um, to begin transitioning with your organization. That's something that you need to do. What were some of your go-to resources um, or or thought leaders that you turned to when building your case and and speaking internally to your leadership team? Sure. So hopefully this podcast will be for future people being asked this question. Um, but it was before the the Proof Point podcast. So for me, I um, you know LinkedIn I think is a, a blessing and a curse. There's a lot of, of garbage out there that I think it. You know, that's probably a harsh way of putting it, but there's a lot of things that are just unattainable for many organizations and many people. But on the flip side of that, there's a lot of great information, a lot of great marketers out there putting out thoughtful content. So, um, you know, both Dave Gerhardt and Chris Walker are advocates of this journey, this journey, which you know, I think I, I already felt, but it was good to have that additional proof and, you know, another person that's thinking the same thing um, to help make that journey possible. And, Honestly, probably the probably the best thing is just this may be the wrong way of putting them, but just be be selfish for a second. Think about yourself as an individual. When you're looking to buy a product or a software, what's the marketing that you like and what's the marketing that you can't stand? What's the marketing that you can't stand from. And so thinking about it that way it will really help that journey. So I, I mentioned that because as I was going through the process. I would think, well, you know, what are some good examples of companies that are doing this? What are examples that I just, you know, skim right past as I'm, you know, going through my inbox or scrolling through LinkedIn? 
trying to be a company that I would want to buy from is was a big help as well. And I'm wondering Same. if you, oh, go ahead, Kathy. I was just going to say, I'm wondering if you uh, remember or have any of any of those examples of those companies that you really admire that you're like, wow, I want to achieve it to achieve this level of status. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, this has probably been brought up on y'all's podcast before. And I know you've talked to Udi, but Gong is, I think, one of the best examples from a B2B standpoint and SaaS standpoint of you know, a company that, you know, when I see an email from them or a post, I'm like, I want to read it. I want to see what they're putting out. Um, Lessonly is another good example. Kyle Lacey, their CMO, they put out a lot of great content. They're a fun brand. It's all about making marketing fun and not making marketing transactional, right? People want to buy from other people, from brands they respect. So those are two examples. Um, Chili Piper is another good one. Um, in the ops space, uh, Sonar software is a, a great one. Um, through the community they've built and through the way they engage with their audience. Um, so those are four immediate examples that come to mind of just people who are doing things different and that I would want to buy from. Well, I think we have a new slogan here that we're going to have to put on a hat and it's MMFA, make marketing fun again. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. We'll do it in blue or maybe purple. So go. it's non -bi it's bipartisan. I don't know. Oh, we don't want to yeah. think about red and blue. We'll have to come up with a different color because we are, we, we kind of. Orange. Or, or, oh, I there love orange. Go. Good one, Jonathan. <laughs> MMFA, you heard it. You heard it here, folks. Uh, first on <laughs> Show Me the Proof, get to the point. Make marketing fun again. Love it. Yeah, Mike, I, you, I think you were going to say something. I was going to mention you, uh, you know, you brought up kind of, being selfish and putting yourself in your customer's shoes, which I think is definitely the right thing to do, yet it's so hard for a lot of the reasons we've already talked about in terms of how people are measured and incentivized and all that stuff. I think it's interesting because um, on the B2C side, you know, you have things like secret shoppers. Like if you've, anyone's ever worked in the retail environment, right? Who, who remembers being secret shopped? I mean, I know I do from when I was like 14 working at Arby's. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think one of the things I've been thinking about this lately is on the B2B side, you should try to secret shop your own product and service. Like, you know, if it's, it, you know, somebody you know, or maybe you go and you, like literally you have somebody internally that goes and tries to go through the process, right? Like create a fake name and a fake email and just go through it and see what happens, whatever it is. Like, I think there are ways to mm -hmm. do it um, and just like see how, potentially bad what you're doing is because i think that's yeah, probably that, the best way it. to realize that the change needs to be made yeah and not only that but I, I think it's important to actually this is gonna sound cliche but like enjoy what you're doing enjoy the company that you're working for enjoy the product that you're working for because if you don't if you would never buy the product yourself like well you're not going to be a very effective marketer of it so that's yeah. step one like if you're sitting there and you think your product is hot garbage you're probably not going to be a very effective marketing. So maybe it's time to find a new company that you can actually get behind. Yeah, 1,000%. 1, 1, I think we have a couple of really good business ideas out of this podcast. So <laughs> make marketing fun again hat. I think we can really make a lot of money with that on LinkedIn. Yeah. And then um, secret SaaS shopper, <laughs> yeah. right? I think we can we can do that. Have have a, a you know, place a B2B marketer or a sales sales leader or, or AE, whatever, um, and have them secretly shop uh, your yep. your SaaS product. And then, uh, and, and, and then, you know, the report that comes out of that, the conversations that come out of that, the all the information that could be com coming out of that, that's brilliant. And I don't know of any other companies uh, that, that offer that service. So we're going to have to talk after the podcast. <laughs> B2B secret shoppers. There you go. If anybody wants it. Here it is. All right. Um, well, let's, I, I love this conversation, Jonathan. You have showed us so much proof in what you've done. And also you've, you've helped us get to the point. And really, um, our listeners out there are going to kind of have a, a really great jumping off point um, from this show to understand, and specific, particularly this episode and your insights on how they can um, really help sort of turn the Titanic of their organization from thinking about traditional marketing, uh, you know, MQLs and leads and lead gen to really changing the tide and, and thinking about it in a different way, in a, let's say, more modern, 
business holistic fashion. Um, so thank you so much. It is time now for the lightning round. Ooh. All right, let's do it. All right. Um, Mike, do you, do you want to, um, you know what, I'll do the lightning round and I'm going to put the pressure on you, do you to think of a bonus question for Jonathan. Oh boy. Yeah. All right. All right. So Jonathan, we'll start with some of our typical, uh, our usual suspects here. What's the main KPI you use to evaluate marketing success? Uh, I've talked about this like, basically the entire conversation. So I'll recap it. Inbound revenue, the most important one for me. Got it. What's a new marketing strategy or tactic that you're looking forward to testing out this year? Ooh, let's see if I can talk about that. It wouldn't be too secretive. Um, I'd say just continuing to lean in on customer advocacy. So I, I talked about it earlier in the conversation around being more present and proactive with customers, but uh, we have a number of different ideas that are coming through the pipeline around really creating more delight for customers, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's something as simple as, you know, sending them a gift for, you know, uh, launching a new plan or, you know, they did do a customer story or they were on a spotlight, like sending them something that's going to delight them, just finding ways to continue focusing on new unexpected ways to delight customers. That is a topic that I absolutely love and something that <laughs> um, that I that I've been thinking a lot here at, at Proofpoint. So it sounds like we may have to have you on again for another case study around this top secret initiative that you guys are working on. And then in the meantime, let's also connect offline because that's a topic that I'm very passionate about. Um, yeah, and maybe for those out there, Proofpoint sends a lovely little package. At least I got it. That had the most <laughs> delicious chocolate that I've ever tasted. So we need, well, we need to just announce where you got that chocolate from. I, I am hopefully didn't be buying it. I am glad that you mentioned that, and thank you so much for for that. We, um, yeah, this is for those that are going to be watching the video. This is what Jonathan is referring to, um, and you get a nice little note from us and inside here is a very delicious chocolate i will share with you the details on this jonathan <laughs> if you're Perfect. interested uh because i think this is quite delightful and i'm glad you enjoyed it um yeah i had to my wife and i were fighting over it so you know it's good <laughs> that that's good that means we, mission accomplished all right yep. um cool well i'm excited uh, i'm anytime you want to talk about gifting or surprise and delight seriously Let's I do it. I, I love that stuff. Um, okay. What is your favorite or least favorite? You could answer it in either way. Uh, business word or phrase? Ooh, I'll do least favorite. That's more immediately it comes to mind. I think in marketing, the, the term of like growth hacking, it, it just makes me gag a little bit. <laughs> I, I think people have the right intentions behind it, but like saying you're hacking something, like, no, you're just doing effective marketing. Like hacking sounds a little bit shady, a little bit illegal. Like, no, just say you're an effective marketing. Like you're not breaking anybody's computer. You're not stealing their strategies. Like just I think we need to rethink how we're talking about that. Yeah, nothing was hacked in the making of this podcast, exactly. right? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Okay. Um, what are some of the podcasts that you listen to most frequently? Oh, let's see. Uh, this is a newer one, but I'm starting to listen to Proof Point podcast. Um, I listen to a number of more operational focused ones from my hat. So um, Shops Talk from Wizards of Ops Community is one that I've been on and I listen to, as well as um, the Revenue Architect and the Revenue Engine are some ops focused ones for those operational people out there. On the marketing side, um, I mentioned Lesson Lee. Kyle Lacey has, uh, the, the I think it's the Revenue Diaries or Marketing Diaries. It's more of a personal approach on marketing. And then Dave Gerhardt, I think he just stopped it temporarily, but he had the DGMG or, or B2B Marketing Leaders podcast, which still has tons of episodes out there. And then last, I'll give one more. Um, Chris Walker, the Demand Gen Live is another good one that it'll sound a lot like some of the things we talked about today. Awesome. That's a very long list of podcasts. I don't know how you listen to all of them. I have to do it. <laughs> Anybody who has kids knows that you have a lot of cleaning and dishes to do every night. So I just throw in the AirPods, listen to some podcasts as I'm doing the dishes, and it makes the dishes a lot more manageable. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why Mike is never always ignoring me when I'm talking to him. He's got that he's got the headphones and I didn't even notice. Um, all right. <laughs> 
who is now you've mentioned quite a few so you so if you if you want to recycle some of these names or think of a new one that's totally fine who's a b2b marketing expert that you admire on linkedin so i'd say on linkedin i think chris walker does a great job of combining you know commenting on other people's posts with his own content and always providing a consistent good good uh Good information. I think a general marketing leader. I know you've you've had them on, but Udi Letter Gore. I think what they're building at Gong is like the pinnacle of marketing from a team standpoint. So anybody who isn't following their work should certainly follow that. Absolutely, yes. And for those listening, Udi was our episode nine guest. So if you want to go back and check out his episode, episode nine, uh, definitely a great one. And I agree with you too, Jonathan. Uh, Udi is not only a great marketer and a visionary leader, but he's also a really nice down to earth guy. Uh, you know, it's hard to really know somebody from a from a one hour conversation, but I felt like he was really authentic and really uh, generous and just a lovely person. So I agree with you there. Um, Mike, do you, I put the pressure on you. Do you have a bonus question? I came for up with Jonathan? something. I don't know if it's a good one. Okay. But, uh, Jonathan, you're in Atlanta, right? I am. What is your favorite fried chicken place in Atlanta? Oh boy. Um, that is if you like fried chicken, I'm hoping you do, because otherwise this question's really gonna flop. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I I do. I'm this is gonna be maybe a controversial answer, but I'm gonna go out of convenience sake. I'm just gonna say Chick-fil-A because it's something that May I may or may not have eaten three meals some days in, in my past. <laughs> all three Chick Fil A when when things are hectic and uh, having three young kids that they love Chick Fil A. So from a convenience standpoint, I know exactly what I can expect. It's very delicious. Chick Fil A all, all day. Awesome. My original awesome. question was going to be Chick Fil A versus KFC. So you already answered that one too. So. Oh yeah, no, no question. <laughs> all right, Jonathan. Thank you now, so much. Now, if you're my... coming to Atlanta looking for a, a chicken place. It's, Probably not Chick-fil-A, but that's still my answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, we hopefully will have some opportunities to, Mike used to do some business um, a couple of jobs ago in Atlanta. So so he's been there. I have not had the chance to travel to Atlanta other than for like stopovers or layovers. Um, and I, big admission here, I've never had Chick-fil-A. So I've got, <laughs> I've got some learning to do here. Um, Jonathan, thank you so much for joining us on the show. This has been a delightful show. We've learned so much from you. You've shared so much knowledge with our, with our listeners and on this podcast. We're really excited for this episode. Um, what's the best way for our listeners to connect with you today? Yeah, absolutely. Enjoyed the conversation today and hope everyone gets some value out of the conversation. Best way to follow me would be on LinkedIn. I have a Twitter as well, but it's not always super active there. A LinkedIn, I post all sorts of things, operations and marketing. So uh, happy to connect on there. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much again for joining us. And uh, we'll be back next week with another episode of Show Me the Proof. Get to the point. Thanks for tuning in to the Show Me the Proof Get to the Point podcast. Join us weekly for new episodes and seriously smart B2B marketing success stories. We'll show you the proof and get to the point every time. Find additional resources on the ProofPoint website, www.proofpoint.marketing, including the full episode library with show notes, guides, templates, and more great resources. If you like this episode, don't forget to subscribe and please leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts.